Start that recording. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> shoot, right when I hit the screen, I turned the camera. It's 3.3. Oh, well, good enough. Is 3.3 the last section used? No. There's like six sections in chapter three. Oh. Okay. So the first, the first heading is continuity. And no final, right? Uh, so we do the comprehensive final at the end, so that way it can make up. Well, here's how we'll we do that. finals. Your score on your final also counts as your lowest test score. So if there's like a test that you completely bond, then you can make it up on your final. So that's the nice thing about finals. Let's do that then. Okay, if I do a comprehensive final, it's going to be comprehensive. Which means chapters one through five. No, just or three through six. One, I think three. we skip a chapter, but yeah. one, just three through six. Just for this semester stuff? Uh, that's fine with me too, actually. Okay. So continuity. Yeah, so since we just had our big break, we'll do quick recap, and then we'll restart section 3.3 .3 and go from there. So 3.1 was continuity. Remember the definition of continuous? Uh, yeah, if there's a sequence inside of the function domain. See, I always thought if, it, if, if you had a convergent sequence in the domain, then it's continuous, right? No. no. What does it mean to be continuous? If so, the image of given, function. let's start out with a function, given f from some domain to the real numbers, F is continuous if and only if f of x is the limit of f of x. Uh, oh wait, no. If, if you there take the sequence inside it, there exists an x or an x not in D for all sequences x n in D that the limit of x n is x not. How's the bracket say this? I think that it has a For all this is the X and <laughs> if every sequence that converges to a point in the domain, for every sequence in D that converges. Isn't it you want that exact definition? Yeah, let's get the exact definition. Because a function f d to r is said to be continuous at x naught in d. At a point. There we go. That will fix all my problems. All right. So this is continuous at a point. Oh yeah. At x naught in d. In d, provided that the number of limit Perfect. That fixes all our problems. Have them. Just talk about one point at a time. That makes it easier. Okay, so f is continuous x at x not in d provided that for all x n in d such that the limit of x n is equal to x not. Provided that for all these sequences, the limit of the image of the sequence is equal to the image of the limit of the sequence. Okay, I understand that. But in this definition it says for some at sequence x not in d. X n in d. X n in d. So oh, the limit for some, of for the all, of the for any. To the sequence of the all those things mean the same thing. Okay. For any, for all, for some, anything. The limit of the image of the sequence is equal to the image of the limit of the sequence. Yes. So it is continuous if the limit or if the but if image the, if, the if the limit of the, of the image of the sequence is equal to the image of the limit of the, of the sequence. That actually just cleared up fog in my head. Fog your head? Just cleared up fog in my head. Okay. So that's the basic idea continuous. Okay. And hopefully today we'll get to a uh, logically equivalent definition, the epsilon delta definition, yeah. which is probably the one that you guys who did calculus before used. Yeah. Okay, and then the next heading would be? And then we proved that 
Sums of continuous functions are yeah. continuous products. Basically, if it's a polynomial, it's continuous. I actually have a question. And actually, if it's a rational where the denominator is never zero, it's continuous. Is x squared plus x a polynomial? Yes. I know I can kick you this. I told you guys over and over and over again. We did a proof close to the end of one of the section, chapter two sections. Two point four. Oh, no. Proving that something was continuous. And I told you over and over again, and I'll say it again now. If you would go back, I did. watch that, understand that proof, you will understand continuity. Okay. I didn't watch it, but isn't it at the end of section one or two? I don't know where it is. Find it. Watch it. And watch it again and watch it again. Understand that proof. We proved right then and there that all polynomials are continuous functions. And if you can wrap your head around that proof, that's as complex as anything we cover in this section. I don't know why the author plugged it there so early, because it would have been really useful to do that later when you guys well, knew what we were doing. In the textbook, then, I noticed when I was reading it, then it said... Yeah, he says this is going to be real important for later, but... Well, also, when he's talking right now, he was like, okay, go back to 2.1. Oh, we did? Okay. 2.2, the extreme value theorem. 3.2. Oh, what did I say? 2.2. Yeah, 3.2. Extreme value theorem. What does the extreme value theorem say? In short, it says if you have some function from a closed interval to the real numbers. By the way, just terminology in case I accidentally say this. When we have a function from something to the real numbers, we call it a real value function. So I might say if you have some real value function on a closed interval. I'm just meaning to the real. Yeah, real value function means to the real number. Spits out a real number. Oh. Anyways, so if you have a continuous function that looks like this, then on this domain, it reaches a maximum and a minimum. Why is that? So kind of like what we did. That seems counterintuitive. So zero? Well, no, it seems very So true. drawing the function, if it's on some closed domain, so from here to here, some closed interval for its domain. Okay. Some closed bounded interval, I'll use. So I've got some function on that, whatever the function looks like is up here. The function will reach, uh, pin that dip down, it will reach a minimum, and it will reach a maximum somewhere in this closed interval. Is infinity a min or a max? No. So this, if you have a function like this and it's continuous, it will not take off towards infinity. Oh, and it's think of the one we yeah. just did with zero and one, from zero to one, zero to one, zero. To one. And it's continuous and it's from a closed interval to the real numbers. Then we're guaranteed on that interval the function reaches a minimum and a maximum. And we're supposed to find that. No, we're, this is what the theorem says. The theorem says that that is the case. That there is. A that there is a minimum and a maximum. Right? That's what the extreme value theorem was. Pretty. She said it just went through my head. It'd be interesting how that proof was. <laughs> yeah. I bet you can find a video online of someone proving it. Probably. If you looked far and wide. Okay. Just go look up this thing. And then the last thing that we did is called the intermediate value theorem. What does the intermediate value theorem say? Almost the exact same thing as this. If f is a continuous function on some closed interval to the real numbers, so whatever the function looks like, we'll just make something up. Then whatever the value of the function is here, and whatever the value of the function is here, there is some point in. Okay, let's. Let's label some things. Let's call this B, let's call this A. This over here is F of A. This over here is F of B. You with me so far? Good? All sense that I can look at slow down. If we have some continuous function on the closed interval A B, so here's a hypothetical one. I'm just marking here's F of A, here's F of B. So far, just drawing a picture. So if we have a function like this, then for any c, any value you pick between f of a and f of b, for any value c, there exists an x naught in the domain such that f of x naught equals c. Okay. So if I know that the function 
reaches this value, and I know the function reaches this value on some closed interval, then I know that for any intermediate value I pick, there is some point in the domain such that f of f point equals c. Yeah, if it's continuous, obviously. That is not obvious. Remember our definition of continuous. Look, saying it's obvious should be basically equivalent to saying that's really easy to prove. No. Okay, so it's not obvious. Because it's not really easy to prove. It's really intuitive from you, for you, because you were told over and over again, think about continuous as I can draw it without lifting up. Right. And you think, well, there's no way for you to drop it down here to up here without picking up unless you hit every point in between. Okay, yeah, that's not our definition of continuous. Right? Observe. <laughs> Watch me draw this. <laughs> Okay, so that's the intermediate value term. That's what section 3.3 is proving. So we'll go back to that and we'll prove that. Okay. And you'll remember last time I had to start by proving what's called the nested interval theorem. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Oh. It's where they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually get smaller. It's the idea that if I have some closed interval, Call this A, call this B, A1, B1. And if I keep making the interval smaller, so if I start with some interval and I keep making it smaller and smaller and smaller, and I do it in such a way that AN is always less than or equal to AM plus 1 is always less than or equal to BN plus 1 is always less than or equal to BN. In other words, my A's never get past my B's and my B's never get past my A's, but it keeps getting smaller. Then there's one and only one number that is always in this closed interval, C. And so there is some number, C, such that a n is always less than or equal to a n plus 1, is always less than or equal to c, is always less than or equal to b n plus 1, is always less than or equal to b n, and it's the limit of this sequence and this sequence. So what this reminds me of is how you could, how you have a sequence and then you have a subset sequence that converges to that the same point. With very different ideas. Well. The idea on that one is, if the sequence converges, whatever the sequence is, every subsequence converges to the exact same thing. So since a n converges to c, every subsequence of a n would also converge to that c. And that's what you're thinking of, yeah. which is something we've heard forever now, right? Okay. Does that not make intuitive sense? No. Remember, a subsequence still has to have infinite elements. So just because you use like every other one doesn't mean you're still not getting a proper C, whatever it is. Anyways, so that's the gist of the nested interval here, which is what we have to use to prove the intermediate value here. So now we're ready to do intermediate value theorem. Right? For like the third time. First. Third. Third. So this is the third time we're doing this. So probably gonna have you guys just flat out write this out on your test. By the way, your test from here on out will not be open book like they've been in the past. It'll be like discrete math tests. Okay, well those were not open book. So you have to know is the theorem that you're going to use. You can't just say, let me look that up real quick. Okay. Like last time we could refer to like 2.3. You know, I have to say, observe this theorem. Yeah, you have to know what theorem you're using if you have to use a theorem for a test problem. Well, you no longer get, uh, maybe I'll let you, we'll say this, I'll give you a piece of paper. No, I, 2.1 theorem. I'll give you a piece of paper, no writing problems on it, you can write theorems on it, you'll give me the piece of paper before I'll look at it before you start the test and you'll do the test. Good? Yeah. So write down the theorems that you have to use for your homework problems and you might want to write down like a quick summary of what it gives you. But you know. Anyways, so let's prove the intermediate value theorem. Alright, what does the intermediate value theorem say? 
It says if we have some real value function on a post interval is continuous.
statement, we're defining two sequences, A N and B N, where A N starts at A, B N starts at B. These things are going to keep getting closer to each other. And what we're going to do is we're just going to take the midpoint and have either B N move to the midpoint or A N move to the midpoint. But so let's draw a quick picture of how this might be happening. So here's A, here's B. We'll have some function on this interval. Uh, here's f of b. A is about right there. Here's f of a. Here's a, here's b. So we're saying a1 starts here, b1 starts here. We're making two sequences. And then these two sequences are going to keep getting closer and closer to each other. How are we going to do it? Well, first off, pick a c. We'll pick a c. Doesn't matter where we pick c. Here's c. Okay? See some point that corresponds to right here. That's greater than the middle point. So we're saying calculate the middle point. What's the image of the middle point? That's right here. The image of the middle point is less than or equal to C, right? The image of the midpoint is less than or equal to C. So in that case, we're going to now make this point A2. And B2 is going to stay the same. As B1. So where do you say that? Where do you say then you make A2? If the image of the midpoint is less than C, make the next A point the midpoint, and next the B point make the next B point stay the same. Okay. So nice. we made the next A point the midpoint, so A1, A2, but B1 and B2 are both the same point. You with me so far? Mm -hmm. And then repeat. So now we have this interval. Here's A2, here's B2. Look at its midpoint, that's right here. Look at the image of its midpoint, that's up here. Is the image of the midpoint less than or equal to C? No. No. The image of the midpoint is greater than C. So our A doesn't change. So A3 is the same as A2. A3 is right there. But our B point changes, and so now B3 is right here. You with me? Mm -hmm. So notice what happens every time we cut the interval in half. So first we were talking about this interval, then we were talking about this interval, then we were talking about this interval. And we're going to keep on cutting the interval in half over and over and over again, right? So, and notice that our ans are always less than or equal to our ans plus one. Are always, maybe just write out my observe here. Right. Observe that. A n is always less than or equal to A n plus 1, is always less than or equal to B n plus 1, is always less than or equal to B n. Right? Mm -hmm. Comma. And observe, well, observe that. And that the length of the interval, B n minus A n, is equal to b minus a over 2 to the n minus 1. What do we mean by that? How big is the interval when we start? When it's a, n, and b, n? A, b. So when a is 1 and b is 1, how big is this interval? b minus a. It's just b minus a, right? Yeah. Or in other words, b minus a divided by 2 to the 0. What's 2 to the 0? So b minus a divided by 1 is still b minus a. So when n's 1, it worked. Let's see when n's 2. When n's 2, what's the interval? Midpoint. It's half of a, b, right? Yeah. Oh, then it's 4th and it's an a. Then it's an when I had a2 and b2, oh. how big was my interval? It was half of b minus a. Oh. So this is how many times have we divided it in half? We've divided it in half n minus 1 times. Right. One less time than the interval we're on. So we're, when we're on the first interval, we haven't divided it. When we're on the second interval, we've divided it once. When we're on the third interval, we divide by 2 twice. When we're on the fourth interval, we divide it by 2 three times. So we've divided it by 2 n minus 1 times. Does that make sense? Yeah. So notice that this is always true, and that the distance between these scenes Kind of get right a lot here. And that the limit of, and the limit of the distance of these things is equal to the limit of, and what's the limit of that equal to? 
do? Uh, do you want to say? Um, no, it's equal to or put on the C. Holy oh, cow. I'm not sure. B is just a number. Mm -hmm. A is just a number. B minus A is just a number. Call it D. What is the limit of D over 2 to the n minus 1? n minus 1, when we're talking about really big numbers, is basically just n. What's the limit of that being? A number. It's a constant. Or not. It's a constant. Yeah, it's a very specific constant. The limit of everything is a constant. You guys are in trouble. Zero. Zero! Zero! Holy cow! Take a One big time. number, it doesn't matter how big. Divide by two infinite times. What are you left with? Zero. Uh, you guys are in trouble. You just fell to class. I don't even know if there's any point continuing with this semester. Uh, well, the point continues. Okay. Wow, that was really hard to get across. Okay, is this just obvious now? Is it popping out again? Yeah. These are the conditions for the nested interval pair. This is the case, and the distance between these two things goes to zero. Those were the conditions of the nested interval pair. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I should explain more, I just don't know what to explain. Where did I put my notebook? Okay, so this satisfies the conditions of the nested interval theorem, which tells us, therefore, by the nested interval theorem, there exists x naught in A, B such that the limit of A, N is equal to x naught, which is also the limit of that's what the nested interval theorem gives us. So if we've got one sequence always coming this way, another sequence always coming this way, and the distance between them goes to zero, then they converge to one point only, and both of them converge to that same point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It's a pretty intuitive theorem. You can go over the nested interval theorem again if any of that's filling. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Uh, now this function is continuous. Since f is continuous, the limit of f of a n equals what? F of a n. F of x naught. F of x naught. Which is also the limit of f of bn, right? Any questions there? So since f is continuous, we have that. And then by definition of c, look, observe is f of x that f of a n is always less than or equal to c. And f of b n is always greater than c, right? So put it all together. Then the limit of f of a n is equal to f of x naught is less than or equal to c is less than or equal to the limit Less than or equal to c 
is less than or equal to f of x naught. Why does that say that f of x naught equal? Oh, I shouldn't have. Okay, let me write it this way. I'm tr trying to combine all this information one. I'll write it on two lines, and then you'll see it. Then the limit of f of a n is less than or equal to c is less than or equal to the limit of f of b n, which gives us that f of x naught is less than or equal to c is less than or equal to f of x naught. That's why I was combining the two. Oh. Which gives us that f of x naught equals c. I should have written it that way. I think that makes it pop out a lot more clear. Okay. So we just found an x naught in the interval a, b, such that the image of that thing gave us a c which is what the intermediate value theorem is trying to prove. Any questions about that? No, sir. Okay. So let's see a quick example problem where we might use the intermediate value theorem. So example. Yeah. Uh, 
No. So let's get over. Let's cover what polynomial function is real quick. If I can write it of this form, f of x is equal to a dot. We'll be done for a second. If I can write it this way, it's a polynomial function. In other words, h can be any real number, it doesn't matter, but the x's are always natural numbers. That's a polynomial function. What's a rational function? A rational function can be expressed as p of x over q of x, where p and q are polynomials. If it's a quotient of polynomial functions, it's a rational function. So here's a polynomial, here's a rational. P of x and q of x are both polynomials. Yes. A rational function is a quotient of polynomial functions. Comfortable with that terminology? Because I think that's like the simplest way to say it. Where obviously we don't have zero down here. You need to get domain. So this one can't ever without zero. And we proved that rational functions are continuous. That's another thing that we proved. This was pretty easy to do if you understand the proof that polynomial functions are continuous. And you understand this proof if you'll go back and watch it and understand it. That's on you to understand that proof. Okay. But we proved it. Okay. Anyways, observe that add this continuous since it's a polynomial function, right? Okay. Now, observe that. Uh, f of 0 is equal to 0 is less than c. Right. And that f of c plus 1 is equal to c squared plus 2c plus 1 is greater than c. Right. Should we all find Yeah, that's all good, right? Or by intermediate value theorem, comma, there exists x naught in zero to c plus one such that f of x naught is equal to c. C is a number between 0 and C squared plus 2C plus 1. So C is intermediate between 0 and C squared plus 2C plus 1. Or in other words, C is intermediate between F of A and F of B. So since C is between F of A and F of B, there exists X naught such that F of X naught equals C. X naught in the open interval. Five. Then x naught is greater than zero, and x naught squared is equal to c. And we're done. That's what we said. We said for any positive number you pick, I can find another positive number such that when you square it, I get your positive number. So there might be a lot of writing on this proof, but this is actually a very simple, straightforward proof. Why did I need to go to C plus 1? Why didn't I just go to C? Uh, is it true that just C squared is always greater than C and that 0 is less than C? Well, you got to get a number greater than C. Yeah, C squared. I didn't need 2C plus 1, right? I could just use C oh, squared. What? In the case that it's 1. No, because... In the uh, case that C is 1. C doesn't equal... Your C1 or C less than 1. What if C was a half? Right. One fourth is definitely not greater than a half. You have to have one bigger, right? Because of so I went one further, that way this is always bigger than C. And I could have used, the fact that you see plus one here might seem kind of weird is my point. It was weird until you squared it. But I just needed something so that when I squared it, I get something bigger than C. That's all I'm thinking. Could have used one there. Could have used one half there. Could have used 5,000 there. 
Could have used 68 trillion there. I just needed something so that when I square it, I get something bigger than T. That's all I was after. Does that make sense? So is there anything weird about that proof? This better feel like something you could easy reproduce. Mentioned by name in the book, 
you need to go look up his proof for it, and the proof has a name. I don't know what the name is off the top of my head, but you can go find that proof relatively easy if you wanted to. But yeah, very unintuitive. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, the book gives a definition of what it means for a particular set of numbers to be convex. In short, when we talk about a convex domain, all we're saying is it's one interval. It's one closed interval. That's what needs to be convex. The exact definition of convex is, so we're talking about a set of numbers. A set of numbers is convex if, when it includes u and v, it includes every number between u and v. So it includes the interval. Well, the interval will be u, v. That's what it means to be convex. I don't know why the author bothers bringing up this definition because you don't really even have to use it, but that's what he says. But now we're going to do a proof where if you use convex by don't get bothered with that because there's no point bothering with it. And the next proof is going to be that we're going to prove that if you have a closed interval, if you have a function from a closed interval like this that's continuous, then its image is also a closed interval. Does that make sense? Obviously. Pass. Oh, so it's not obvious? No, it's I can use. Yeah, and I'll erase this side because it might be useful to have the It's going to be useful because obviously that's what we can use. Obviously. Since this chapter is the intermediate value here. So let's just make sure you understand it exactly. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So 2 
Since Y1 is in the image of the sink, there exists X1. Well, maybe say, let's write it both together. Since Y1 and Y2 are in the image, then there must exist X1 and X2 in I such that F of X1 is equal to Y1 and F of X2 is equal to Y2. Right? If Y1 and Y2 are in the image of this function, then there must have been two points in the domain that map to Y1 and Y2. That's the only way they can be in the image of the function. Some points map to them. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been in the image. You remember the difference between the image of the function and what the function maps to, right? Why don't we just start with our uh, x's instead of our y's? We're proving that this is an integral. Oh, f of i, yeah. Yeah, we're proving that the image, we already know the domain's an interval. We're proving that the image is an interval. The way that we're proving that the image is an interval is we're saying for any two points you in the image, any points between them. then every them. point between them is also continuous. Or is also continuous. in the interval. Yeah, you can see in it. the image. Okay. Continuous is a property of a function. Okay. It is not a property of a set. It being an interval is a property of a set. I'm thinking in my head that there are infinite points in this where you can track a sequence to it. So let's make sure we understand that. So remember, x1 was just a thing that mapped y1, and x2 was a thing that mapped y2. I don't know which of those things are smaller, x1 or x2. x2 could be 5, x1 could be 7. Right. Right? Right. So I'm saying, so I know that, let, let's kind of get a picture up here real quick. Maybe that will help. So I know I've got some function. Here it is. I know the function is on this interval i. I went and I grabbed two random points out of the image of this sink, y1 and y2, where my only rule was that y2 is greater than y1. Okay. So here's y2, 
And let's say that this was y1. Let's make this slope down a little bit more. And we'll say that this was y1. X1. So here is x2. Here is x1. Because right? Your x1 would be the min of the x2. So I took two random points that were in the image of this function, y2 and y1, where y2 is greater than y1, right? And I said, since they're in the image, there has to be two points, x2 and x1, that map to those things, right? Now we're saying pick some random c in between there. Here's c. And I need to argue that there exists x0 in here, such that f of x0 equals c. Now here's what I'm saying. Since f is continuous on this interval, obviously f is continuous on this closed interval right here. If f is continuous on this interval, oh, uh, f is continuous on this interval, right? right? So what is that interval? That, that's this interval right here, x min to x max. I'm saying call the left hand one of these things, whether it's x min or x2, x min. Call the right hand one of these things, whether it's x min or x2, x max. Because it could have been that x2 ended up over here. Well, and x1 saying, how did you say that your bigger interval was, was continuous? That was given. If i oh, is an right. interval, here's i, and f is a function continuous on this whole interval, then f is definitely continuous on this piece of the interval. Right. Mm -hmm. You good? Yeah. Okay, now we can just use the intermediate value theorem directly. Five. Then by then by intermediate value theorem. There exists x naught in the open interval x min x max such that f of x naught is equal to c. Okay, wait, that didn't just prove it was an interval. Six. Therefore, c is in f of i. If c is in f of i, why does that matter? Remember how we were proving that this was an interval. We said, we're going to prove that this is an interval by showing that for any two points you pick in the interval, every point c is also in the interval. Sorry, I kept using the word interval over and over again. Shouldn't have done that. We're going to prove that the image is an interval by showing that for any two points you pick in the image, we also contain every point between those two points. So if for any two points you pick, we also contain every point between those two points, then we have an interval. And you did it by doing x not to c for the image of x. Yeah, so we said pick any point between y1 and y2, call it c. And then we showed c is also in the image. So pick any two points you want. If it contains every point in between those, then it's an interval. That's the property that the interval has. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, that was the end of 3.3. I'm not ready for this. <laughs> so well, we're not yeah. done yet. The test is very soon. Like in two weeks. weeks. In two weeks. Yeah. We'll probably finish. Next two. week we'll learn five, four, yeah, five and six. six. And after that, the test. Okay, so now we're on to 3.4. 3.4, we get to the idea of uniform continuity, special kind of continuity. And we're going to find out that any function that's uniformly continuous is also continuous. But what's our intuition for a function being uniformly continuous? The intuition for being uniformly uh, continuous is, is that I can limit how much the function changes on a small interval. So. Let me help you help that make sense to you. So a function that is not uniformly continuous would be like the x squared function. The x squared function looks like this, right? 
kind of did that bad, a little bit more curvature to it. But the reason that this is not uniformly continuous is because I can get as big of change I want in the image in any small interval that you give me. I'm confused. So for, for any small number you pick, I can find a point in this function where it changes by any big number I pick. Right, so like... So pick a small number. One. One. So you're saying if we pick some small interval one, now pick a massive number. A thousand. So a thousand is a massive change, right? I'm saying that eventually on this function, I can stick this one interval and I can find a point where the function changes by a thousand in that interval. Oh, okay. So on this interval, oh, it only changes by two. What about here? On this interval, it changes by 10. What about here? On this interval, it changes by 100. But if I come out here, on this interval, it changes by 10,000. Oh, yeah, that changes by what we were looking for. So it's not uniformly continuous. Uniformly continuous means that I can find, for any small interval you pick, I can find some other interval such that my function will never change by more than this on this interval. Okay. Kind of a weird concept when you first hear it, but I think well, once it goes to quit. Or huh? I just yeah, what does x just be that? Or 1 over x? x. Yeah, x would be uniformly continuous. Yeah, 1 over x would not. So 1 over x would not. So functions that kind of blow up as they grow, they start going faster and faster and faster and faster as they go, are functions that are not uniformly continuous. Would be an example. So that's the intuition of uniformly continuous, and we'll come back and give it a really solid definition. That's the definition in the same way that continuous is like, you don't pick up your pencil while you're drawing. That was a really high level equation. Okay? So, uh, let's go ahead and take a break, and then when you come back, holy well, crap, this section is so small. We'll need to start a few more Yeah, but there's a 3.7. Oh, there is? Yeah. Right. Make sure it doesn't have a star next to it. We skip one of the stars. It's called limits. Ah, uh, yeah, we'll do limits. So, yeah, we'll do 3.7.
to. I have never seen Taming of the Shrew, but all of his other toys I have seen. Taming of the Shrew is literally about a guy trying to tame a freaking cray cray woman. Yeah, I know. And I sit here and I'm looking at it and I'm just like, wow, I could fall asleep. Don't right even now. Like and not miss it. Your play? Um. Did you? Yes and no. Did you like your play? Your choice? Choice? was good. Uh, James is a far better actor than I thought. Mm -hmm. That was impressive. I don't know why you guys picked such a. I mean, James kind of explains some of the history behind why you guys chose the play that you chose, but it's so, like, old school. Uh, no. Uh, Did it feel like childish? It focuses too much on specific people. And, gives other people no chance to really develop. Like when James first came out for the night that I watched, James and uh, Catherine, when they first started talking, they were talking kind of fast, and they were a little off, and as the play went on, they settled into their roles. When you never got a chance to really do that. When you yeah. first came in, you were kind of fast and off, and by the time you got comfortable on the stage, it was like you were off like, again. And so that was a common theme for people coming on the stage. It's like, I never got to see a act. It's like, uh, kind of faster with Doug going. Same thing with like when Maggie came on. I just came up with all this energy real quick, and then as she was settling in, it's like, she was gone. Like, text, it's like, I think that's mostly on the actor, though. Not well, the play itself. Right, but the point is, here you guys are. This is a drama class. Your first play, probably. This is the play where you're supposed to be learning how to do these types of things. So it was expected, but so, it's like you and Catherine and, I don't know, the name of the other people, but well, Carl and this is another good example. Right, he, he was came on and then he was off. Yeah, Jane was on, she was off. <clears throat> yeah, so him, Catherine, and uh, the and the Jane. maid girl and the grandma. Uh, yeah, Amy. And, you know, you're right. Like James they kind of dominated everything. The last two weeks, James was pretty much trying really hard to focus on minor characters and trying to get them into it right up front so they were so well, different and not falling into their roles. Brink was rough. But the, he could only work on Brink as soon as everybody else had their characters. Well, our next play is going to be a murder mystery and it's going to have, like, everyone's going to have equal, like, Yeah, so I think that would have been a lot better for you guys to have a more balanced play that way. As far as the action plays off, I mean, the humor was good. I kind of liked it. I hated the Really? Yeah. You think Grant should have got away with everything he did? No, I think Grant should have died. The yeah. kid should have moved on with his life. And that's life. You know, people die, kids are left in situations that aren't ideal, and that's life. And life goes on, you deal with it. But I didn't like the, introdu the introduction of death. I did and didn't like the introduction of death. I mean, the idea, okay, so now death stuck up in this tree. So things can't die. I'm fine with that idea. I'm not fine with it once it becomes his choice. I don't like the idea that he was just humoring. Well, he was trying to teach you a lesson. Yeah, I don't like that. Here he is, Dad, and he's going to put his whole job on hold to teach this one old guy. He got the whole play, dude. Bless him. <laughs> and then when it was all said and done, it's like, and the kid dies anyways. Yeah. Gramps was just trying to stay with Pud, so if, which he did. The whole idea that if Gramps would have just gone in the beginning and Death would have humored him gives a different outcome. Death taking around caused the kid to die. Right. I see. So in his humoring, he killed the kid so that the kid <laughs> and this other guy could go on and be together. So I didn't like that. Gramps should have died. It should have been Death's choice. Death should have been stuck there. In the end, Grandpa should have come to the realization that life goes on, what happens, happens. Kid has to grow up in tough circumstances, kid has to grow up in tough circumstances. Tough life. Yeah. But so you, you got that play pretty well. Like, Uncle James was saying some things like, 5% of the audience will catch on that. Death is just up there to humor. Exactly what he said. That's not said of the truth. Yeah, see, so yeah, I don't like that. So, so as far as the actual play went, humor was good. Then I ended the play, didn't like it all. But well, of course that's just a tasting. Yeah, come try that one. But James's acting was, oh yeah, impressive. He 
job. I didn't expect him to be able to do that. Catherine, too. Catherine, yeah, but Catherine does a good job, but I feel like her role fits her more naturally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and because so much of it just works so well. I mean, not even just that she's small, but her voice, voice the yeah. way that her voice already is, just adds so much to the role already. Like, she doesn't have to try for that. She just gets that for free. She's one of those people that it's just kind of entertaining to listen to her talk, period. It doesn't right. even matter what she's talking about. And so, she has that going for it. But, yeah. Same pet snake. Well, it's almost like, like, so one of the great humor elements. One of the humor elements in this play is supposed to be like low kid cursing my grams, right? And her voice <laughs> cursing already <laughs> was just hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so. So that, that was great casting, I think. But yeah, I would have preferred to see a play that was more balanced between everyone so I could see everyone kind of have a chance to come into the character and then, yeah, just like the end of that play. That's cool. That's a win in my head. <laughs> huh? So that's a win in my head. That's a win in your head? Bert probably's the one that casted us all. Bert no, he's probably, probably the third grandpa. Taylor, he put Carl. me in the third grandpa. Put you in the second. No, he put Carl first grandpa, Taylor second grandpa. Oh yeah, I don't know. That was that was weird. Weird. Yeah, it would have been interesting to see other people do the exact same roles. And oh my word, that would be so fun that. to reproduce this play and have everyone a different role. That would be so funny. Kind of. The, I kind of think it'd come back to bite you. Well, it's not like we perform it. I'm saying like, it would just be cool to watch. It would be interesting. It would be interesting to see. Just this next play is gonna be cool to watch. James transform to a whole different. Yeah. Well, I don't think he's well. You should not purposely go for a small role because you had a big role in the last play. Right. But the class. The purpose of the class is to develop your ability to perform dramatically. You need to give every student an opportunity to develop. Right. right. Isn't that the point of the class? It's not to put on a good production. It's well, the students to develop. Well, no, well, part of the part of the building is how to create a stage, how to create, how to make up, how to do Yeah, that's true. I assume that people who had smaller roles were more responsible for other aspects of it. Yeah, that's true. Well, I built the audio in the you. I'm She did more possible. work to build it on stage than you did. And that's what counts. Yeah, I <laughs> I guess that's not technically true because when it's all said and done, all the work they did on stage didn't really add anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just created the best. So I guess I can't say that. Are you kidding me? Those were beautifully arranged. <laughs> no, a fence was beautiful. It I made that fence. That's what I'd say too. Except <laughs> if you sit where the fence was and you sit over here and you look at the fence on the side. It's I know. Like that. <laughs> that right. so bad. I know. You can't expect the best right now. Are you kidding me? Work woman number two. Oh, uh, work man. I had a beard. <laughs> that makeup. Yeah, you had a new costume. Cool, too. Oh, beard mini. No, you didn't. I, she yeah. took her hair down. She took her hair down in the second act, so it was like the funniest dance. I would have loved to see Mim play the uh, grandma. Uh, she got Mim got casted as Demetrio. As Demetrio. And uh, then she they probably did, would have done all right to that too. Then they did a recasting. But Jessica's kid just had a talent for playing the grandma. Like, that's where they belong, especially if it's a stern. They learned from Mama Huh? So they learned from Mama Dove. No, I Jessica. <laughs> Through. It just works out for him, though, I think. But yeah, make sure you read it on Wednesday. Don't read it. Dude, I was just. Donnie, have you read Carl it? Carl Monte Cristo. And, uh, yes, a long time ago. I cannot believe she's making you guys read that one. We're reading that in Senior Lit. Did you like it? Uh, yeah. 
I like the overall story. I thought that the book dragged on. It split between 34 hours. But the beginning did. 34, I said 54. F no, it's, it's 54 on audio notes. And it's all the yeah. box. I can pull it up. It probably just depends on who's reading it. I mean, some people read a lot slower than other people. You mean the by the fastest reader, the two times so, speed. <laughs> I cannot believe yeah. this is making you guys read it. It's so slow pace. I think, I think you can easily slow, like, do it at a very fast rate and still follow the entire yeah, story. One, two, She's like, Super slow book. I would definitely not all recommend all it. We all say, yeah. And she yeah. we named a lot of novels. I don't understand why things that get classified as classics get classified as classics. I will say really? right now, half of you will not get to that one. Oh, she knows rarely that. impressive to me. Have you read Frankenstein? Frankenstein, I have read. That's the classic that they all say is like extremely good. Guys, but another one that I read that's just supposed to be not is like Crime and Punishment. That's another one that. Is that a book? Yeah. Yeah. Dose. How do you know Steve Dostoevsky? Something like that. Uh, another big one is. Uh, Something so maybe you don't know War and Peace, but War and Peace is another big one that's this historical fiction. Uh, and you're watching this uh, aristocratic family growing up in Russia during the time of the French Revolution. And I read stuff like that, and all it makes me want to do is go learn more about Napoleon. <laughs> it's like, throw this away, read the biography on Napoleon's life, and I feel like I'm getting way more value. And I'd be more interested in all about the history. I know, but it's like, even in this side book where Napoleon is just a side character, he's like the most interesting thing here. Yeah, I know, I guess. And so stuff like that. And like it just. Huh? Kind of like Voldemort. Hitler in. Kind of, but in see, the difference is the only way to learn about Voldemort is, is the Harry Potter books. Now, I'm not getting Harry Potter thinking, oh, I should just go read this side book, which is going to give me way more information about what I care about. Right? It's like if you were reading Harry Potter and you knew that there was a biography on Voldemort's life, <laughs> what would you rather do? Keep reading Harry Potter or go read the biography on Voldemort's life? There literally is. Donna Harry told Potter. us to read. Well, I hope not, because I doubt it's pretty much. Count of Monte Cristo, Frankenstein, and Lamus. What? Who did you? No, not Lamus. It was. Oh, it was Six Feet. No. <laughs> What's the name? Tell Two Cities. Tell Two Cities. Oh. No, that's Who one that this? I recommended to me a couple times. I've never gone down. Tell Two Cities. Donna. Is that Donna trying to find the. Uh, if you want to tell Two Cities and break the sign. Like I said, I've never read it, so I'm not I'm not positive what it's about, but the, the, the feel I get from listening to people talk about it is it's talking about the way two different cities developed based on. Uh, the, the social norms of the cities, etc., or something to that effect. I don't know. Like I said, I've never read it. Have... Two brothers, and they and they are together in their childhood, and they end up breaking apart and building their own cities. And it's really creepy, actually. Sounds. It's like my. She it's like gave us those three books. So. Inspired 
and then Aristotle and Socrates, and then we're going to go start a yeah, so it was, it was, a it was the Odyssey, I thought. Right. No, the Republic. No, the Odyssey is Homer. The Republic. He has the Republic, which That's is... That's the book that Nicole mentioned, or not Nicole. Where Nicole. he sets up a hypothetical... The Utopia City is the Republic. Right, yeah. That's, That's what they wanted to do. They yeah. wanted to create a perfect society. In he was so That's not Aristotle. Him. That's Plato. Aristotle very yeah. much disagrees with that being a Utopia society. So Plato. The Republic is Plato. It's his most famous work. It's... I think it's the biggest of his works. But it's great. The Republic is great, but that's a more dense work. I don't recommend that as an introduction. So, even it. though it's, as far as technical reading goes, it's easy. Okay. Now, reading your textbook is orders of magnitude more difficult than this reading This textbook? Yes. Because I can read this textbook. Yeah, you can read and follow this textbook, then there's precious little out there in the way of just a literature that you couldn't read and follow. And you could even read and follow Aristotle if you would take the time to not just read it, but read, 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 understand the argument, read, 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 understand the argument. The same way that you read a math textbook, you'd be just fine reading Aristotle. It's not hard. This textbook is by far more dense than any philosophical reading that you're going to do unless more modern philosophical reading okay. probably you're going to run into is they use so much jargon that it's hard to follow. Use the jargon, jargon like unnecessary technical terms, and sometimes they're using it in a very specific way. The only way to understand how they're using it sometimes is to understand their past indication. And so you can't really understand them until you go understand, go understand, go understand, go understand. So, do you think Plato would look down on American society? And or think that's a good, good, good government, democratic republic. Would he look at our government and think it's a good government? He would look at our government. Well, it's hard to predict what he would say about it because we have a type of government that he never got to see. I mean, he's he's very critical of democracies. For Thinks democracies are in a lot of trouble. Right, you told totally they're not the same. They're, they're going to end up prodigy children coming up in government. Prodigal, prodigy, like actual formed kids. In a democracy? No, he thinks that's how government should be. Oh yes, yes. He he thinks that government should be done by the best. The best should govern, and so. Obviously, that's what we think too. The question is, how do you get the best to govern? Right. You have to find some no political agenda. For and yeah, so unfortunately, in our society, the only people who will be elected are people who a you know about, and b really, 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 really want to be elected. Which those two things in and of themselves cut out a lot of personalities that would make good presidents. For example, someone like George Washington, there's no chance of being president today. Because he has no desire to be president. The only reason he was president is because people push he had such a massive reputation due to his successes in war. Who's the greatest modern general you know of? Exactly. I know. Who's the greatest modern general you know of? Oh yeah. Exactly. You wouldn't even hear about George Washington today. And so So our system is broken in that way. He would he, he would classify our system as an oligarchy. He would say that only the wealthy can rule. Because you have to be very wealthy to get elected, typically. Yeah, but we kind of formed our government so that rolling doesn't give you too much power. Right. The design of our government, we, we had a different mentality than a lot of people have setting up governments. So a lot of people, when they go to set governments, they think about what would be perfect, what would be ideal. The American idea of setting up government is uh, ideals are possible. People suck. How can we stop them from screwing up? <laughs> that's exactly what Jonathan says. That, that's our mentality towards government. Our government is not, what's the utopia? Our government is how can we safeguard against people screwing up the best way possible? And that's the design of our government, which has turned out to work out really, really well. Like bankruptcy. 
like bankruptcy. No. Like, I'm, I'm talking about the way our constitution is written, oh. not the way that we, not our current set of laws necessarily. I'm talking about the design of the government, the constitution. Yeah. Checks and balance, because our, our, our government has drastically shifted away from where it was to be. Well, it was never designed to be utopia, but it's degenerated in that certain branches have taken power that was never theirs to take. For example, uh, when's the last time we declared war? Uh, I think the last time the United States actually actually declared war was like World War II or something like that. Iran just declared war in the United States. I don't think they did. They did? I don't think they did. They're, they're, they threatened. No, they raised their red flag and said, this is an act of declaration of war. That's why I read. The media has been greatly blowing out of proportion. I know. What's been going on. I get that. So it would be really easy for you to read an article and think that we're at war with Iran when we really we're not. Because I'm pretty sure that we're not. And I'm pretty sure that we're further from war now than we were before. Because Donald Trump's finally doing in the Middle East what we should be doing. Well, in the Middle East... Then I thought that, thinking okay, this is the media talking again, I thought we'd been literally like pulling out, pulling out, pulling out, pulling out. Right, so the idea was um, from a 10,000 level point of view, 10,000 feet in the air, our plan in the Middle East was let's appease the terrorist groups, try and get them not to do anything radical, and pull out and get the region to take care of itself. That was the big plan. Which isn't a very good plan. Because what ultimately ends up happening is so we're bribing, sending in lots of money for people not to do things. Big law saying, here, we'll give you the benefits so you don't have to do this crazy thing to get the benefit. That money ends up going towards the groups yes. that <laughs> then make them more powerful to do what they want to do in the first place. So Trump finally stepped up and said, uh, well, you know what's spurring all this? We killed one of their generals. Right. That was behind right. a terrorist group. Yeah, so we might have um, killed the general. And we, which I think was a fantastic thing to do, because a couple days ago they actually attacked a U.S. embassy. They flat out attacked a U.S. embassy, and they killed two people. Go ahead. I don't know if they killed people in the process, but the fact that they even did that shows that they feel a lot more bold towards America than they should. So Trump's, well, we responded, took out one of their generals, and then he said something along the lines of. And if you retaliate against us in any way, we have 52 targets ready to take out right now. <laughs> <laughs> Which is yeah. exactly the approach you take. The it's Democrats like, were crying over that. Right. I watched They're the having all this problem of, it's not a proportionate response. We need to respond proportionately. Responding proportionately encourages a response back from them. Right? If a kid does something bad, you and you get after the kid in a light way, they're just going to do it again, and they'll probably do something even worse. They're like, well, if you're going to do that, I'm going to do this. And they retaliate. But if you punish them very harshly, if you go over the top, punish them. No, they're not doing it again. So a kid does something like, I don't know, they won't eat their food. What do you do? You send them to their room without them. Think about what you're doing. They are now required to be in a specific location for several hours for not eating food. It's kind of extreme when you think about it. Could you imagine you're sitting there at a restaurant, you didn't finish your food, so they lock you in a room and you have to be there for five hours because you didn't finish your food. It's kind of extreme when you think about it, yet that's the response you use when you're dealing with people who are being irrational. Iran's being irrational. Right. They think that they get to go and keep pushing the boundaries because we've kind of just been like, oh, don't push it. Push it. No, don't push it. No, don't push it. Push it. Okay, we kill your general. Push it again and see what happens. We got 52 targets ready to go. <laughs> Dude, their response was crazy. They had like millions. Have you seen the videos? You can see them. Their freaking protest was so mean. Like yeah. more than I've ever seen in America. Yeah. Well, you had it both go both ways. You had people in the Middle East protesting, and you also had people in the Middle East flat out celebrating because you just killed someone at the head of a terrorist organization. Now the media is largely liberal. Liberals are right now against uh, terrorists. No, against Trump. Trump. And so the rule is, Trump does Republicans do something, whether good or bad, we oppose it. So the media is going to come out against Trump, doesn't matter what he does, that's good or bad. So he made a great video, and of course the media is going to come out against it, and say now we're on the brink of war with Iran. 
if all this bad stuff's gonna happen, you know, Iran's gonna lose their place. All right. The memes are. I know, the memes are incredibly <laughs> abundant. <laughs> oh, but they've been so good. Uh, it was one of those, like, everybody's tap out this summer. <laughs>
uniformly continuous. Anytime we have two sequences such that the limit of their difference is zero, we know that the limit of the image of their difference is zero. So since the limit of un, since the limit of un and vn equals zero, then we know that the limit of the image of un and vn equals zero, right? Since it's uniformly continuous. Well, if this equals zero, plug in what we know that those are. un is just xn, vn is just x naught. The limit of a difference is the difference of the limits. What's the limit of this? Zero. F of x naught. What's the limit of this? F of x naught. F of x naught minus f of x naught is zero. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. We know that this is equal to zero, and then so. That's right here. The limit of f of xn, move this onto the other side. Right. This is f of x naught. Like, yeah, sorry. Because this is what we need to show for it to be continuous. This equals this, means it's continuous, right? Okay, mm -hmm. there you go. Pretty simple? Mm -hmm. All right. So now let's do what I was saying before. Let's prove that x squared is not uniformly continuous across its whole domain. Now let's prove that 1 over x is not uniformly continuous. Now we'll limit it to some small part of the domain. Some small part of the domain. Why are you doing that? Huh? I'm just saying we're going to do these examples. So let's prove that this one's not uniformly continuous. We already know x squared is not uniformly continuous based off of our intuition. Now it's formally proven. All right. So let un be n. So this is just a sequence. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's just n, right? And vn is just n minus 1 over n. Well, I mean, that can't happen. I picked it two sequences, and maybe I should have did this to hopefully my laziness isn't confusing you. You understand those are sequences, right? Yeah. So I picked two sequences, n and n minus 1 over n. Those are both in the domain, right? Yeah. So I picked two sequences, and notice that the limit of un minus vn equals the limit of n minus n plus 1 over n, because that was a minus. Uh-huh. So, so why did you want that? N minus n, minus n is what? Over n. Is zero. 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 So we just got the limit of 1 over n is equal to zero. Zero. Okay, so that satisfies the condition. Anytime we have two sequences such that the limit of their difference equals zero, then the limit of the difference of their image better be zero, which in this case it won't be. Right? Because um, I'm proving that this isn't uniformly continuous. Remember, that's what I'm proving. So here, I found two sequences where this happens, but the image isn't going to work. So let's see that. So f of u n minus f of v n is n squared minus n minus 1 over n squared, right? Just plugging it in directly, nothing fancy. Just squaring it. That's this squared out. Mm -hmm. Roll that out, because I like you might not be able to follow this in your head if I went straight to here. Two, which is not zero. I see it. See it? Mm -hmm. All good? Anything weird? Yeah, algebra makes sense. Yeah, algebra makes sense. Does the logic of the proof make sense? <laughs> I'm working on that. Yeah. Both of those are really I'm working on applying the definition. The definition says that anytime we have two sequences in the domain, such that the limit of their difference is zero, then the limit of the image of their difference better also be zero. Right? If this is true, then this better be true. If this is true and this is false, it's not uniformly continuous. Right? Remember, when's it, when is an implication false? When the conclusion is true, but the hypothesis is false. That's when the implication is false. So if we want to show where this isn't the case, we need where this is true and this is false. The if part's true and the then part's false. Which else is false? You just said the opposite. You confused me. You just said the first part is false and the second part is true. So and that's, that's what I meant. Yeah. If the hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false, the implication is false. Yeah. And that's the only thing that's false. So if we want to... If we want to show it's false, we need to find a place where the hypothesis is true, but the conclusion is false. Mm -hmm. Good? Mm -hmm. Alright, so let's do another example. Another nice simple one. So we'll take f is from 0 to 2. Notice not including 0. Why aren't we including 0? 
because of the function one over x. Yeah, because that's not even defined. Okay. We need to make sure we have the function. So function f from 0 to 2 by f of x equals 1 over x is not uniformly continuous. Once again, let u n equal 1 over n and v n equal 1 over 2 n. And observe that the limit of their difference is zero. Right. That's easy to However, the limit of the image of their difference is n. The limit of n is not zero. Wait, one second. Wait, it should be negative n. Yeah. Thank you. And um, how did you do that again? How did you so, get n? n into it. Oh, 1 over 1n. One, one, 1 over n minus 1 over, oh, sorry, oh. 1 over 1 over n yeah, minus 1 over 1 over 2n. Okay. Makes sense. So you just showed that that function is not continuous. It's not uniform function. It is continuous. Notice both these functions are continuous. They're just not uniformly continuous. What does knowing that they're uniformly continuous do? It just tells you from telling you this. Tell if it's that. uniformly continuous, and you know anytime you have two sequences, such that the limit of their difference converges to zero, then the limit of their image converges to zero. That's exactly what it gives you. Two of them don't show. Alright. So now we're going to find out that functions of a specific form are always uniformly continuous. Uniform continuity comes in handy when we get to integration. Oh. Intervals. Definite intervals. <laughs> so. Right? If it did converge to zero, then we would flip this to a less than epsilon. 
Since it doesn't converge to zero, then instead of that being a less sign, it's greater than or equal to. Does that make sense? Okay. Next, by the sequential compactness theorem, do you remember the sequential compactness theorem? Uh, yeah, I think that if, if you have a set that converges, then you also have the subset. No, no I no. think it's. Um, for any point in your interval, I can find a sequence that converges. No, that's what it meant for it to be dense. Oh, this is the one where. Is if you have a closed bounded interval, and there's several. then for any sequence in that interval, it contains a subsequence that converges to a point in the interval. So if we're in a closed bounded interval, any sequence I have in the interval contains a subsequence that converges to a point in that interval. Okay? You follow that? So by the sequential compactness here, since un is a sequence in there, it contains a subsequence that converges to a point in the interval. Okay? Okay? Now, we already know that un converges. How do we know that un converges? Because of the... The limit of un equals the limit of vn. And if the limit of un equals anything, it converges. That's what it means to have a limit, it converges. Another theorem we had is that if the sequence converges, every subsequence converges to the same thing. Right. So since a subsequence converges to x0, then I know un also converges to x0. Right. You good up in here? Yeah. All right, and then I can say similarly, uh, the limit of, well, I don't want to say that. Just flat out, similarly, the limit of v UN equals what? If it's continuous. X equals F of X naught. Equals F of X naught. And notice that's also what the limit of F of VN equals as well, right? So now if we minus F of VN equals zero. Perfect. Therefore the limit of Questions in that? What does the box mean again? And so it is and thus it is proven, and thus it is demonstrated.
We're done. Cut up. Uh, oh, there it is. Good? Yeah. Okay. So the next section we're getting into the epsilon delta definition of continuity. This is a big definition, but it makes great sense. And then for you guys who already calculus, this should already be uh, this should have been the definition that you were taught. It took like a couple like now important note. This is logically equivalent to the definition we already gave you. In other words, if you think about this as a definition of continuous, or you think about the definition that we gave you as a definition of continuous, it's sixes. It doesn't matter. They're logically equivalent. They're secretly saying the same thing. In terms of functions from the real numbers to the real numbers. In terms of real value functions, they're logically equivalent. Maybe with special different types of functions, they're different, which I'd be very surprised if they were actually different. But in this class, they're logically equivalent, they mean the exact same thing. So you can memorize either of these as your definition for continuous and be fine. That make sense? All right, so this is called, uh, well, we typically refer to it as the epsilon delta definition for continuity, just because those are the two variables I'm using. Let's write it out exactly and then continue to give you uh, intuition about it. A function f from d to r is said to be continuous. read the definition and then I'll draw the picture. So a function from some domain to the real numbers is said to be continuous at a particular point in the domain, provided that for any positive number you pick, there exists some other, for any epsilon there exists a delta such that if your x's are within delta of your x naught, then your images are within epsilon of the image of your x naught. What does this mean with a picture? So, here's my picture. Here's some continuous function, right? Pick a point x naught. I want to know is it continuous at this point? x naught that goes up. Okay. Here's f of x naught. With me? So we're saying. If for any epsilon you pick, if for any interval around x naught you pick, x naught is down low. I'm sorry. For any epsilon, uh, any interval around f of x naught you pick. So for any interval I pick around here, so I go up epsilon and I go down epsilon. So this is f of x naught plus epsilon. And then this is minus epsilon. 
maybe I'll just do five sets of one exercise. You with me so far? If for any interval around f of x naught you pick, there exists some interval around this. This is plus delta minus delta. If for any interval you pick around this, there exists an interval around this such that all these points map into this interval. They don't exactly match up, but the point is, all the points in here map to points that are inside this interval. So let's say it again. Pick some point, find its image. If for any interval you pick around its image, I can find an interval in the domain so that every point in the interval in the domain maps to a point in the interval in the image. Then it's continuous. I have to at least one point or the point. Say it again. So if we pick some point that we want to know, is it continuous at this point? Here's the image of that point. If for any interval you pick around the image, I can find an interval around the domain If for any interval you pick around its image, I can find an interval around the point such that this interval maps into this interval. What is the image of this interval? It is here to here, right? Yeah. Notice that's contained in this whole interval. So if the image of this interval is contained in this interval, we're good. Okay. So for any interval you pick around the image, I can find an interval in the domain so that the image of the interval in the domain is a subset of the image oh. or is a subset of the interval out here. So in other words, f of let me do it this way. f of the interval delta or x naught minus delta to x naught plus delta is a subset of the interval f of x naught minus epsilon to f of x naught plus epsilon. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The image of this interval is a subset of this interval. So if for any point x naught you pick, I can find, sorry, so you pick x naught. If for any epsilon you pick, I can find a delta that makes this true, it's continuous at that point. You feel like you can wrap your heads around that? I get that. Let me just find the three to definition. So a function from d to r is said to be continuous at a point, provided that for any interval in the for any interval in the codomain you pick, I can find an interval in the domain that maps into a subset of that, centered at this point, centered at this point. I'm just having a hard time. Reading the definition and seeing the interval. Uh, remember another way that we can write this. This is the same thing as x not minus delta is less than x is less than x not plus delta. You see that? Same thing over here. This is the same thing as f of x naught minus epsilon is less than f of x is less than f of x naught plus epsilon. Okay, I see. So that's exactly the interval that we wrote here, right? Mm -hmm. x naught minus delta, x plus delta. So anytime the image of this interval is a subset, not anything. Any interval you pick here, I can find an interval here such that this whole interval maps into that thing. The image of this interval is a subset of this interval. So for any interval you pick here, I have to find an interval here such that 
the image of this interval is a subset of this. And then it's continuous. Uh, x naught is the number we'll be changing. It's continuous at x naught. We're talking about continuous at a point. Uh, so let's, let's log it through real quick using this definition one that's not continuous. Maybe that will help. So let's take a picture of one that's not continuous. So here we are, we've got a function that goes, stops there, jumps down, goes like that. We know that this thing is not continuous, right? right? And we know it's not continuous at this point, right? right. So let's set this up. Here's our x naught. Here's f of x naught. We don't want our epsilon to go past here, then we're in trouble. So make sure our epsilon is small enough that it doesn't jump the whole gap. So we'll say epsilon takes us from here to here. Now we're saying it is impossible for you to find the delta around this point such that everything here maps into this. Right? right? So that gives us here to work with. But any interval I pick around here, I'm going to get some of these points. And what's the, oops, I just put that on the wrong one. Any interval I pick around here, I get some of these points. These points are not in here. You see that? It's not. It's not continuous. Because for this interval, in the codomain, there's no interval you can find around x naught such that all the points in there are mapped to in here. Mm -hmm. Because any interval around x naught is going to include some of these points. Yes. Which are not in this interval. So it's not continuous. Now we need to prove it or what? Well, we didn't define a specific function. Oh, yeah, that's just definition. That was just a picture to help you see how it applies. Now, this kind of stress this a lot because chances are continuing from here. This is the definition you're going to see for continuous in terms of capitals. It's not going to be that sequence one. Sequences, you deal with them a lot as you're developing calculus, but after that, you're going to have continuous ones for any point in the uh, sequence I can find a, a, a convergent sequence to that point. Now, why did you go back to that? For any convergent oh, yeah. sequence in the domain, okay. no. if x a converges to x naught, then f of x a converges to f of x naught, right? Where x n and x naught are in there. Yeah. That was continuous. Now for this definition, any interval you pick around the image of a point, there has to exist an interval around the point such that the image of the interval around the point is a subset of the, inter of the interval around the image. Good? Okay. So that's the intuition of uniformly continuous, or not uniformly continuous. That's another definition for continuous. Your book calls it the epsilon delta criterion for continuous, meaning if it satisfies this, then it's also continuous. So we'll do that for, we'll show that if it satisfies this, then it's continuous, and if it's continuous, then it satisfies this. And those are logically equivalent. But first, let's uh, maybe use this definition to prove something's continuous, and see how we would do something. Do it using this. You see what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I think first, just like wrap your head around an example, and then maybe go back and jump into the river. So, uh, to prove, let's prove that. Yeah, from R to R by F of X is equal to X cubed is continuous at T. Good? Yeah. So now I need to show that for any epsilon I can find a delta. Right? And these proofs are going to be kind of weird like our other proofs for convergence in that you kind of do scratch work on the side to figure out what you're going to do, and then you're going to say let delta equal blah blah blah, and you're going to be like, why did you pick that for delta? 
It's going to be out of the blue. It's because you do side work, work it out ahead of time, and then go back and plug it in. Okay? So on left epsilon not equal something. Let epsilon greater than zero. Pick any epsilon you want. Comma. And then because I know how this is going to work out, I'm going to write something that you're going to be like, what the heck? But then you'll see how it comes out. Okay? And let delta equal the minimum out of 1 and epsilon over 19. There's your what the heck moment, right? <laughs> Obviously, just look at the problem, right? <laughs> Two. Observe that. Now, what are we trying to show? We're trying to show that if x satisfies this, then x satisfies this. You said epsilon. You said let epsilon be greater than zero, and then let delta equal the minimum. Right. Now what? Such that what? So now I'm going to show that if, observe that, if x minus x naught is less than delta, then dot 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 x cubed minus a is less than epsilon. A function is continuous at x naught. A function is continuous at two. If for any epsilon you pick, pick any epsilon you want, there exists a delta. That's this delta. How we got it to get to, such that if x minus x naught is less than delta, then, then f of x minus f of x naught is less than epsilon. Right. Well, okay. Totally. Good. I think that's pretty cool. It's. I just don't know how you're gonna do it. Though. Right. So, so I think you see a big picture of how it works. Uh -huh. Now it's just a matter of like how do you find the numbers and plugging it in, right? So if x minus two is less than delta, then. x cubed minus 8, let's see, that's also equal to x minus 2 times x squared plus 2x plus 4. Did I do that right? 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2. I think I did that right. x times x, let's just make sure I'm not making mistakes. I'm going to multiply these two out real quick to make sure I get this. Do you understand what I'm doing? You're plugging that in. I'm making sure that this was an alright number. Okay. So we'll find that out real quick. We get x cubed plus 2x squared plus 4x minus 2x squared minus 4x minus 8. Right? Uh, we, we've already done this. Uh, x minus y to the n is equal to x minus y times x to the n minus 1, y to the 0, plus x to the n minus 2, y to the 1, plus da, da, da. We already did that period. So, that's hey, all I in my head. Hold on, I'm confused how you got how. So, the average here is good. I'm confused with how you got that. How did that equal that? Why does it imply this equal this? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that? Yeah. Where did you well, get x minus 2? Where did it you get just, that? It just, like, that is literally. I just factored this out of this, which has a remainder of that. Oh, okay. I'm just rewriting that. <laughs> I need an x minus 2 to come out of this because that's what I know things about. I know. It's and just, you're just pulling random numbers around. <laughs> now I'll be I'm wondering. Okay. Everything up to here should have been weird, but pulling an x2 out of this should not be weird. I don't know how you got that. X minus 2 is less than this. Okay. I'm going to keep going with this statement than a lot of things. Okay. We're not done. I told you ultimately oh, I'm going to get this. this is, just like our limit. is less than epsilon. I'm just doing it out as I go. 
right? So I'm, I'm going to get to here. I, that's what we talked about in the beginning. Now I'm just doing all the work to get there. And which will make you see where this comes from, <laughs> right? So then x cubed minus a, which is equal to this, is less than or equal to x minus 2, the absolute value of x minus 2 genes, keep doing the work, times the absolute value of x squared plus 2x plus 4. Okay, now here's what, how can I say this, <coughs> this cyber is kind of, since this is less than delta, I know that this is less than one, because delta is what's ever smaller out of these two things, okay? Oh. Right? Yeah. So I also know that, oh, it could equal one. Right, in which case this is less than 1. Oh, right. So I know that this is always the case. This is where the 1 comes from. I wanted this thing to always be less than 1, because that's going to help my math over here. Good. And so if I force this thing to be less than 1, rewriting this inequality another way, I have 1 is less than x is less than 3. Right. Are you good with this to this? So, the biggest that this thing right here can ever be is what I get when I plug in 3. Oh, uh, that's 10, 19. Yeah. No, it's more than 19. No, it's 19. 9 plus 6 plus 4. Okay. 19. So, this is less than x minus 2 times 19. Right. Right? And now I know x minus 2 is less than delta. Or, sorry, is less than delta. x minus 2 is less than epsilon over 19, right? right? Which is where that one comes from. So now I need this to be less than epsilon over 19, so this comes out to epsilon. So I get x cubed minus 8 is less than epsilon. Okay? So the 1 was a number that I picked. Yeah, yeah. Just to make this nice, to help clean up the algebra over here, to limit this thing. And then, the epsilon over 19 is what I needed to get this to epsilon. So that, that's where those two numbers came from. Yeah. You see that? Once again, I, I don't know any like tricks to tell you. Well, it's kind of like it's confusing is. Remember, I can make this smaller than anything I want. Okay? Right. For any epsilon you pick, I find a delta. I can pick a delta as small as I want. I don't need to find the biggest delta that works. I just need to find a small delta. Right. So make sure my delta is less than 1, which gives me this. And oh, then, for sure, make it less. Yeah, so for sure, make my delta. Make sure that the biggest my delta can be is one, which gives me this information, which helped me simplify this. And then we came out with okay, and we also need that to be less than epsilon over nineteen to make the thing come out to epsilon. So those are the two. You'll typically have it be a min like this. This is very common. A min of some number you picked just to get something like this, and then the one that you, comes out at the very end that you need. When it really is going to be the one that comes out. Depends. And then, if epsilon turns out to be 10 trillion, 10 trillion divided by 19 is way bigger than 1. Right. But for my proof to work, the biggest it can be is 1. So I say delta for 1 works. Why does 1, why couldn't it be 2? It, it probably could have been 2. It probably could have been 10. So that's what I'm saying. You're not finding the biggest delta that works. Don't do that. That's gonna, you're going to hurt your head. Find a delta small enough that still works. So I may say my delta could be bigger than 1. I don't care if this epsilon over 19 comes out to something massive. Who cares? OK? 
keep my delta smaller than 1 at least, and that keeps math easy. Why do we know that in this case, epsilon over 19 is the one we use, though? We don't know which of those two we use. It depends oh, on what right. epsilon is. Okay, so we still don't know. Yeah. It depends on whatever's smaller. That's what we use. If epsilon's bigger than 19, we use 1. If epsilon's smaller than 19, we use epsilon over 19. We use a minimum of those two things. Okay. Make sense? Working on it. This is one of those ones that you just need to do like six proofs like this to get a feel for it. It's the same thing when you're proving like this converges to this, and it just takes through a bunch of them, then you start to get a like I don't know tips and tricks. To yeah. Are you always gonna have the min of two values? No. Sometimes you don't need that and it just comes out nicely. But it's it's a very common strategy. It's very common that you take the min of two things. Less than delta, but it's also less than 